Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our next hymn lesson. So last week we looked at A Mighty Fortress is Our God, one of the greatest hymns probably ever written, uh, you know, the anthem of the Protestant Reformation. It was written in 1529, and today we're going to move forward a few hundred years and look at Before the Throne of God Above. This hymn, Before the Throne of God Above, the lyrics to the hymn were written by Charity Lees Bancroft in 1863. Now, I just want to pause for a minute and say I was surprised when I found this out. I've always thought of, of this song as a modern song, but the words really aren't. They were written in the 1800s. Um, however, the tune that we all sing in church, Before the Throne of God Above, this is modern. This is written by Vicki Cook with Sovereign Grace Ministries in 1997. So a little more recent. Um, Shane and Shane recorded this song, but they actually did not give credit to Vicki Cook for the tune because they thought the tune was public domain. They thought that the tune was written in the 1800s by Bancroft along with the words. And, which, and I've talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people think this hymn and the tune we sing is old, which is really uh, a compliment to, to the tune. It fits so well with the text. But anyways, um, Bancroft, the, the author of the words, was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1841, and she was the child of an Irish minister named Reverend George Smith. Uh, she also wrote six other hymns, none of which are really well known at all, um, but all of her compositions were eventually published in a volume titled Within the Veil in 1867. And I believe that um, Before the Throne of God Above, which when she wrote it, it was called uh, The Advocate. That was her title for it. I believe it was actually published first um, in one of Charles uh, Spurgeon's church's hymnals. So just a little background on Before the Throne. I couldn't find very much more on the author. Um, not a lot of info on her. But let's go ahead and read the lyrics. So the first <clears throat> stanza of this hymn says, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Stanza two. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, Upward I look and see Him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. And the last stanza, Behold Him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I Am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Hmm. Three short stanzas, but there's a lot of good truth in this hymn. Let's look at how the words line up with Scripture now. So the first uh, half of this first stanza says, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. So this great high priest we're talking about is the one who's pleading for us, a strong and perfect plea. What we say is not perfect, but what our advocate says for us is. Let's see what these verses say. Romans 8, 34. Who is, says this, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And then 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. So that talks about Jesus being our advocate, our mediator between God and man. What about this a great high priest whose name is love? Well, um, we have to first establish that Jesus is God. John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. And 1 John 4.8 says, God is love. So we can um, conclude out there that Jesus is love. 
So a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Good, it makes sense. It's biblically accurate. Then the hymn goes on. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. So my name is graven on his hands. Isaiah 49, 16 says, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. That second half of the sentence makes more sense in context. But anyways, then the next line, my name is written on his heart. That may sound kind of weird at first, but what it's referring to there is our sins placed upon Jesus while we were still sinners. You know, Romans chapter 5, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this also refers to our um, deep relationship, intimate relationship with Christ. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. In the next part here, I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Uh, Romans 8, 33 says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And then a few verses later, 38 and 39, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. All right, so stanza two. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within... Upward I look and see Him there who made an end of all my sin. It's such a, just beautiful words there. And Hebrews 2.18 says, For because He Himself has suffered when tempted, He is able to help those who are being tempted. So Jesus, when He was on earth, He was tempted by the devil, but He was without sin. So when we are tempted, we can look to Jesus for... Um, for help when being tempted, because like this says, He made an end of all our sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. Yeah, don't accidentally uh, switch those two words there. I've, I've done that before. <laughs> before. It was really embarrassing. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Then I have a few more verses listed here in Romans and Galatians that you can look at um, that talk about our sin and, and Christ taking on our sin and us um, taking on Christ's righteousness. But we'll move on for now. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. Romans 3, 24 and 25 says, um, We are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. And then 1 John 4.10 tells us, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now the final stanza, Behold Him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness. Here are the four instances in the four Gospels that talk about Christ rising from the grave. And then 1 Peter 2.24 says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. And then going on, The great unchangeable I Am the King of glory and of grace. I am is a name for God. It's not saying the great unchangeable I am. No, that would be blasphemy, of course. I am is a name for God. Let's look at what Exodus 3.14 says. It says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The great unchangeable I am, Malachi 3, 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One with Himself, I cannot die, John 3, 36, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. We know that's talking about um, eternal life, not 
our physical bodies die, but our souls will never die. Uh, my soul is purchased by His blood, Acts 20:28. 20, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. And in the last line, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Colossians 3.23 Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. All right, so Before the Throne of God Above is really a, a beautiful hymn. We don't have to look... We don't have to examine it too much if we want to theology test this song. It's pretty obvious how biblically sound and, and theologically deep this hymn is. But at the same time, it's presented in a way that an outsider, I believe, could easily understand. It talks about, um, you know, it glorifies Christ for His redemptive sacrifice and our response to it. Um, it contains expressions of adoration. It contains expressions of confession of our sin and assurance of our pardon um, and thanksgiving and submission to God. It's really great stuff. And it, and it follows a really good progression, too. In the first hymn, it talks about going to, to Christ, you know, before the throne of God above um, and reminding us that we are His and nothing can separate us from Him. And then in the second stanza, it talks about um, our sin. Satan tempts me to despair, but to look to Christ because the sinless Savior died, so our sinful soul is counted free. We are pardoned by His death. And then um, in the final stanza, Behold Him there, the risen Lamb, uh, my perfect spotless righteousness, great and changeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, adoration, adoration, adoration. And then it talks about our future and our hope. One with Himself, I cannot die. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. So really, really great hymn. Uh, uh, really biblically sound, like I said. Um, and one that's great for believers, but also outsiders as well. All right, so let's go ahead and, and look at our Bible study and look at what it means to go before God in prayer. Before the throne of God above is one of my favorites because it, it speaks the beautiful truth that Christ died in our place on the cross. He took our punishment so that as believers, as those who are justified, we don't have to wear the guilt of our sin anymore, but we wear the righteousness of Christ. But I think one of the main things we can learn from this hymn is that it's an important reminder that we need to pray. We must constantly pray because that's how we communicate with God, along with reading the Bible, of course. Now, how often do we, do we really pray? Uh, and, and what are the reasons that we pray? You know, if we only pray once a week, or if we only pray to ask God to give us things, how do we expect our relationship with Him to grow? Any relationship with another human would not last if we only spoke to them once a week or if we only asked them for favors. We can neglect to pray because we are busy or because we feel maybe an overwhelming just guilt of our sin and we don't want to pray or maybe because we think that uh, it's not that really that important. But all of those reasons point to one thing, and it's the idea, the, the idea that our time is more important than God's, or other relationships are more important than our relationship with Christ. Prayer is a crucial practice for believers, but not only that, it's a wonderful gift from God. We pray for, for many different reasons, but there are three important reasons to pray that I want us to look at today. And they are we pray because God is God. Two, we pray because we are sinners. And number three, we pray because God hears us. So let's look at that now. Let's, let's look first at we pray because God is God. If you have a Bible, you want to follow along with me. Let's look at Matthew chapter six, uh, Matthew six verses nine through thirteen. This is Jesus speaking. He says, "Pray then like this: 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, this is all familiar to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. But just a few verses earlier, before verse 9, he says in verse 7, And when you pray, um, do not be like the, the, the Gentiles. And earlier in verse 5, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And he goes on and on. So, the, the first we, the reason that we pray is simply because God commands us to. He doesn't say there, if you pray. He says, when you pray, we must pray. Now, look at the first line here, I guess the, the second line of this prayer, where it says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means to be made holy. We're praying that God might be holy. Not, not saying that as if God might not be holy, but we're actually acknowledging that He is God and that He rules over us, that He is King, not us. So this puts things in the right perspective uh, for the rest of the prayer. He is God, therefore we submit to Him and submit to His will. So now look at verse 10 where, he sa- uh, where it says, Your will be done. So what does this mean to pray for God's will to be done? Well, if we pray for God's will be done, pray your will be done, this means that we must not pray for anything immoral. We should pray in line with God's character and purpose, not just say whatever we want and then add Jesus' name at the end of it. We must pray according to God's will. Secondly, praying your will be done means to be committed to pursuing the knowledge of God's will. And in order to do this, we must know the Scriptures, right? The more we know what the Bible says about God, the more that we can obey His will. Third, praying your will be done means that we must submit to God's perfect wisdom and sovereignty, even during trials. This is difficult to do, but we have examples of of that. Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane that there might be another way than Him going to the cross. Or when Job says, The Lord gives and the Lord Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's okay to ask God for things. It's okay to ask Him to, to fix various trials in our lives, but we must understand that His will is perfect, unlike our will, and He demands our trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. And lastly, praying for God's will to be done is to pray for the final kingdom. In the line right before your will be done, the prayer says, Your kingdom come, your will be done. So this is, part of this prayer is partly eschatological. Uh, We look forward to the coming of His his kingdom, His eternal, perfect kingdom. So, God is God, like we said a minute ago, so we must submit to His will and pray, Your will be done. It is a sanctifying grace for us individually when we pray for God's will to be done. And really, it's really what's best for us that God's will be done and not our will, our flawed, imperfect will. So secondly, we pray, first pray because God is God. Now second, we pray because we are sinners. Let's flip over now to Hebrews chapter 4. And if you'll give me just a minute, I didn't mark this in my Bible like I I should have. (laughs) So Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, verses 14 through 16. It says, uh, it says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace 
to help in time of need. So the author of Hebrews in these three verses makes a really great case for the superiority of Christ as our great high priest. He, in verse 14, it talks about Jesus' Jesus' ascension, you know, passed through the heavens. Um, and then in verse 15, it talks about his sympathy with what we experience. You know, it says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Um, these are our grounds for this superiority. But we should not conclude that Christ's superiority should make us too afraid to come near to His throne because verse 16 tells us to draw near to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help us when we need it. So that's, that's, that's pretty amazing, right? I mean, God is, is God, like we said a minute ago. He is superior. He is all-powerful. And yet He tells us, draw near to the throne of grace in your weaknesses. The original audience uh, in, in, in Hebrews knew the Hebrew Scriptures very well, the Old Testament. So they knew that when God promised punishment, that He really meant it. <laughs> we, we see that a lot in the Old Testament. And they knew that they were in the same position as the generation who never entered the promised land. So that probably caused fear in, in these people and made them question if there was anything that they could do to prevent God from turning His back on them. And, and we're not too different from them, are we? I mean, fear makes it tempting for us to avoid Christ. Maybe the seriousness of our sin may make us want to, to shrink back from God. But avoiding God will lead to apostasy. Our sin and our covenant unfaithfulness must not make us stay away from Christ. Instead, we must draw near to His throne. Christ opened up the Holy of Holies to us through His death on the cross. And so we must draw near in confidence. Now, this is not an arrogant confidence. No, but it's confidence in God because He promises to forgive us if we submit to Christ. We are sinners, but that's why we pray, to receive His grace, His grace that never runs out. So don't just, don't just confess your sin, but repent of your sin and trust in God's power to deliver you from sinful temptations. So we pray because God is God. We pray because we are sinners. And lastly, we pray because He hears us. Now let's flip back to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to find it here in my Bible. Romans 8 verses 26 and 27. It's fine. Okay. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I love this verse about prayer. Have you ever not known what to say to God? Have you ever just wanted to pray, but you just don't know what to say? Well, it says here, the Spirit helps us pray. And knowing that the Holy Spirit tenderly prays for us in our weakness should encourage us to pray. These two verses are, are a message of encouragement, especially when we feel our weaknesses, when we feel weighed down. But a sense of weakness drives us to pray, and how encouraging it is that we um, that we are not on our own in, in this, not on our own when we pray. We don't have to figure out the perfect prayer or make sure that we're all, you know, cleaned up and, and whenever we, before we pray. But no, instead it says here we have a helper, and that helper is the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. He prays for us. He helps us in our weaknesses. And the prayers of the Holy Spirit are perfect prayers. The Holy Spirit, says here in verse uh, 27, intercedes for us according to the will of God. So they're always answered. He intercedes for us on an emotional level too. It says, 
with groanings too deep for words. He groans for us. He knows our, our pains. He knows our strengths and He knows our weaknesses. He knows our joys and He knows our sorrows. And He prays for us exactly for what we need and perfectly according to the will of God. Now, this all may be a little bit confusing. What, what does that mean, the Holy Spirit prays for us? Well, we don't understand it all because we can't fully comprehend the nature of God. And I'm not going to try to completely explain what all this means because I can't. But what we do know is this. We know that God loves us and cares for us so much that He gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us, and to sanctify us, and to pray for us. So when we don't know what to say to God because we feel um, so much guilt for our sin, or we don't know what we need, or we just don't know what to say for any other reason, the Holy Spirit is there praying on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. He searches the heart and He intercedes according to the will of God. So, church, I encourage you to pray and to pray and to pray some more. If prayer is not a regular part of your life, find a time that you know that you can, you can, you can pray and, and do it every day. Make your prayers intentional, too. Pray specifically to praise God, to uh, adoration, and then specifically pray to confess your sin, and then specifically pray to thank God for His mercy and for His blessings in your life. You know, make your prayers intentional. God is God. He is King, and He commands us to pray, and He deserves our prayers and our praise. We are sinners who need mercy, and He tells us to come to the throne of grace boldly because He is merciful. And He hears our prayers, and when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit knows what we need. So run to Christ, run, run to the throne of grace, and rest in Him with the sanctifying gift of prayer. So let's pray together now. Dear God, thank You so much for the gift we have of prayer, that we don't have to go into the temple like in the Old Testament, or we don't have to go through a priest, but we have direct access to You because of Christ Jesus. Help us to, um, to trust that when we don't know what to say, that You know what we need, God. And help us to trust in You and to follow Your will. And if prayer is not a regular part of our lives, help us to commit to that and make it a regular part of our lives, that we would trust in You and get to, to know You, God, more and more. We love You. In Jesus' name, amen. Satan tells